Good afternoon, welcome to Market Wrap number 182. Stuart Williamson here at the home. Here we have a snapshot of new ideas and what's going on in the UK market. Um, sometimes around the world, just really telling you a bit about what we think is going on and what you might find useful. So it's just a bit of an idea for our investors, our clients who are using our services to find property. And that's really what we do. You give us a criteria for buying, whereabouts would you like to do it, why, what are you trying to achieve, is it a heart or a head decision. He gives that information and we'll go out and try and find property that suits your needs. And I think last year we invested about £133 million around the world in a variety of different vehicles. So that's what we do. This week what are we going to talk about? Well I'm here in Dubai, it's uh, lovely and balmy, 25 degrees, looking out of a Sheikh Zayed. Um, it's a vibrant economy and a great place to work and live. I'm visiting clients here, it was National Day uh, uh, earlier on in the week, and so I'm visiting clients just to talk about their requirements and what they'd like from their property portfolios and how we can add value. What's new? When you look out in the marketplace and you see this, the same sort of headlines, avalanche of landlords to sell before tax breaks cut in half. And yeah, capital, uh, capital gains tax breaks have been cut from 12,000 to 6,000, and as of next year, they're going down again to 3,000. So that's pretty, pretty grim. High mortgage rates, punitive property levies, wipe out potential profits. All depends what you're buying for though, isn't it? I mean, if you're buying to create yourself a pension, and create yourself um, income for the longer term, then those things aren't that big a deal. And that's certainly the way I look at it. So you've got those sort of things. Other headlines are death of buy-to-let property is a usual, useful cautionary tale for all investors. That was in the newspaper as well this week. So a lot of negativity out there, but there does seem to be some real optimism settling, settling into the market, which can't be right really, because we're so used to everyone being negative. I thought I'd have a look at that and see is really buy-to-let finished? Obviously, I don't believe it is because it wouldn't be in the marketplace otherwise, but I think there's a lot of positive stuff going on. What information am I using? Basically, I'm going to look at the Bank of England and what they're saying and then look at some of the rates, what's going on with different sorts of rates. I'll put my glasses on because I've written this out and I need to be able to look at that. Well, people often say that sentiment is fickle, that narratives of optimism or negativity get harder to dislodge the longer they're left to run. Now, the Western central banks are struggling to convince investors that inflation remains a threat. You know, we all see it drop very quickly. You know, that's very positive. And, you know, people are starting to think, well, perhaps it's not such a big deal. We've touched on on several market wraps recently. However, the, the, the S&P 500, the index that attracts the largest listing of companies in the US, climbed 8.9% in November. It's best November since 1980, if you took out the pandemic fuel rebound of 2020. Global stocks recorded their best month in three years. So there's a lot of positivity there. The message from markets is clear. Central banks are done hiking, and all that's left to debate is when the first rate cuts will arrive. Holders of this view were given another boost this week by the Eurozone figures showing that annual rate of inflation had dropped to 2.4% in November. That's very positive. So why are the heads of central banks insisting on, on making what appear to be quite outlandish statements very negative? Andrew Bailey this week um, is very keen. Uh, he said it's the, the UK outlook is the worst he's seen in his career which shows a misunderstanding of the communications that the Bank of England governor should be sending out. This is the view of Simon French, who's the chief economist of the, the head of research at Pamuk Gordon. Growth, productivity and profit requires optimism, and central bank leaders are not giving that out. So that's what basically the research people are saying, is that the Bank of England is saying the end of the world is still very much nigh. So is it premature to celebrate? Should you really be saying, if you do, you know, inflation is gone? long live growth. A new paper from the International Money F Monetary Fund offers a good clue as to why Mr. Bailey and his peers are very keen to spoil the party. Researchers Amil Ari and Lev Ratnowski draw on recent IMF research of more than 100 infl inflation stocks shocks since the 1970s and offer two reasons for caution. Firstly, inflation is generally persistent. 40% of countries in the IMF study failed to resolve inflation shocks even after five years. It took the remaining 60% and average of three years to return inflation to its pre-shock levels. Secondly, and perhaps a more important measure, countries have historically celebrated victory over inflation and loosened monetary policy prematurely in response to an initial easing of price pressures. Denmark, France, Greece and the United States were among nearly 30 countries in the IMF sample to loosen policy 
prematurely after the 1973 oil price shock, for example. In fact, almost all countries in their analysis, 90%, that failed to resolve inflation saw price growth slow sharply in the first few years after an initial shock, only to accelerate again and become stuck at the fast inflation pace, paper stated. Today's policymakers must not repeat their predecessors' mistakes. Central bankers are right to warn inflation fight is far from over, even as recent readings show a work on moderation in price pressures. Inflation is not dead, you know, it's probably mortally wounded, and um, it'll take a while for it to come back. But they have to be on the lookout for this, this happening, which is good good policy, you know. I think perhaps um, quantitative easing went on for far too long, and if we pulled that back earlier, and I believe it has been pulled back, although I could be misquoting, perhaps things would be better now. So the question is, will when will falling rates start? Is the is there an era of, are we in an era of low rates now? Will they persist? Interest rates that are higher for longer weigh on property valuations and transactions, transactional activity. But permanently high interest rates present a different threat entirely. The onset of rate hikes in 2021-2022 set off a debate amongst economists as to whether something enduring had shifted in the global economy. Could it be the case that for a period of falling rates, that characterise the post climatic financial crisis booming of property are an anomaly or are actually reality. So are low rates here to stay? Bank of England research is attempting to tackle this question this week. They take the view that there are two powerful forces now exerting long-term downward pressure on global interest rates. Firstly, which is relevant to me, is the world's ageing population. This means that people reaching retirement can now look forward to living another 20 years or so, a figure that will now rise to 30 years for the coming generation. This will require a massive surge in savings, which banks will lend to firms chasing diminishing returns, weighing on market interest rates. Secondly, slower productivity growth means firms have lower expected returns on their investments, which reduces demand for capital, again, weighing on rates downwards. This factor feels, given that we, how little we know about how what the future economy will have, I mean, the effect of artificial intelligence could inf- impact productivity amazingly and make it go up. Um, nevertheless, the, the researchers conclude that without a reversal in these trends or new forces emerging to offset them, long-term interest rates will remain low. So statistically, rates should stay down. Now, let's quick, quickly look at UK house prices. The recovery in UK house prices continued in November. Nationwide said, said this said this week, values rose 0.2% during the month, the third for successive monthly increase that trends annual decline to less than 2%. There has been a significant change in market expectations for the future path of bank rates in recent months, which if sustained, could provide much needed support for the housing market activity, lead economist at the Bank of England said, Robert Gardner, which is exactly what we're talking about. You know, inflation has gone down, now we're talking about rates coming up again in June this coming year, uh, going down again in June this year. So that's a long, a lot different from two years hence when we're talking about the plateau approach as opposed to the Kapchang Junga approach, right, up and down. Uh, indeed, separate figures published by the Bank of England this week showed that mortgage approvals for house purchases, which is a great barometer for future activity, rose to 47,000 in October, up from 43,000 in September. Bill Knight of Knight Frank. Um, oh, sorry, Tom Bill of Knight Frank, uh, head of research, says, if we are not at the bottom, and I'll read it carefully, so listen, if we're not at the bottom of the current slowdown in the UK housing market, we must be close. Price indices are potentially more volatile due to low transactional numbers, but sentiment has improved in recent weeks as the worst of the economic data moves behind us. Inflation is below 5%. The best five-year fixed-rate mortgages have fallen to 4.5%, and speculation is focused on the timing of the next rate cut, not the size of the rate cut. After a flat autumn, the UK housing market should see a spring bounce in 2024, provided a general election is not called in the first half of the year. So there we go. General election could mess things up. Politicians at it again. So that's really what was going on house prices. Very briefly on the Scottish rental uh, freeze, is it a good idea or a bad idea? Well, basically, they've capped um, rents at a certain level and they can't be increased during the tenancy. They can be increased in between tenancies, which basically means that when a tenancy ends, landlords are cranking them up. 
and increases in rates in Scotland at 12%. And there's a lot of data to back up the fact that the rent freeze has not actually helped. It's actually forced, house, uh, forced rentals to go further up. There's some excellent research from Zoopla out this week about it. There's some uh, great research from uh, Retty & Co, who are the Edinburgh-based estate agents. They're all saying that it's the same thing, that by having the rental freeze, it's leading to less landlords. And apparently 12.8% of all landlords in Scotland got out of the market in the last three years, compared to the, to the rest of the UK, specifically England, where only 5% got out of the market. So it's causing a real lot of landlords leaving, which is at the worst time because they're not building enough houses up there. They build 12% less new homes in Scotland than they do in England, and in England they're building virtually none. But the point is they're not building enough. And Retty & Co, for example, say it's been a very blunt instrument and it ha- because it doesn't stop rental rises between tenancies. So you can only go up by 3% during a tenancy, unless you've got extraordinary circumstances, you can go up to 6%. But then in between tenancies, bosh, it's up by another six. So it's not a very good instrument. It's not been handled very well. It's leading to people leaving the market, which is the last thing we need. So it's not great. Is the Scottish rental freeze a good idea? It's been proven on the continent. I can call it that now because we're not on it in the EU. Uh, I remember when I was a kid, going on the continent for a holiday. That's where all the posh people went. Um, it's a blunt, in, a, blunt, a blunt instrument. It hasn't worked on a continent. And there's no reason why it should work here. So that's not great. So what are we seeing? We're seeing overall there's a feeling that sentiment is much better in the UK market. If you read this about house prices going down, you can probably draw, draw a line across the UK, say just below Loughborough, below those Midlands locations. Those are the areas that are flat or even receding in price, like um, very on the south coast, Brighton, all down that way are probably going to fall by 10% over the next year. But if you look at north of that line, you've got appreciation and you've got positivity. So when looking at buy to let, those are things to consider. Most important things to consider, what are your goals? What are your aspirations? How do you get on the housing ladder? Get some discipline. Start a budget, start saving, work out how much you need to achieve what you want to do. I spoke to a gent this morning, lovely man, lawyer, 55, hasn't really got a lot of money behind him, wants to retire to a lovely location in the UK in 10 to 15 years. And he said to me, what, what are the things I need to do? I said, you need to get a discipline. You need to stop the spending you're not, you don't need. And you need to start planning towards a set goal, get a smart goal, which is, if I remember, specific, measurable, something is a reasonable and targeted. So you've got to have timely, timely, not targeted. So you've got to have those goals. And that's what it's all about when trying to build up a property portfolio. So there we go. That's it for this week. Hope you found it useful. Uh, Do comment. It's great to hear from people. Uh, Do like, please. And uh, do subscribe if you're not subscribing. Happy days. Thanks very much. Cheerio.